Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the final session of the 2022 Wilson Center China Fellows Conference. On Monday and today on Wednesday, uh, we've been bringing you the work of some of the very best uh, North American scholars on U.S. relations with China and the way that Asia as a whole deals with China. Uh, we are very glad that you've joined us for this final session, which is on China's influence overseas. This comprises uh, questions about democracy, norms, uh, and diaspora Chinese communities. There's been an awful lot uh, written in recent weeks about the trip 50 years ago that Richard Nixon went, uh, made to Beijing to meet with Mao Zedong and Zhou Enlai, a trip that uh, resulted in the Shanghai communique and eventually in the normalization of US-China relations. And because uh, we are now in a uh, low point over the past 45 years in our bilateral relations, the Nixon visit is mostly being discussed in terms of what it meant geostrategically and why he went. But of course, it wasn't just about geopolitics. Nixon and Mao uh, decided to work together to counter the Soviet Union. But in doing so, they effectively gave the Chinese and American people permission for the first time since the Cold War to encounter and work with each other across a whole range of human activities via NGOs, uh, via universities, um, through the arts. Uh, they were the American people and the Chinese people have been able to work together relatively unencumbered uh, over the past 40 years. That now seems to be under threat as the United States and China get closer and closer uh, to something like a Cold War footing. And it has, it has had an impact on NGOs uh, very strongly on Chinese American communities and Chinese diaspora communities throughout the world. And so as security becomes the measure of ever more things in bilateral relations, one of the questions we face is what, what about the legacy of Nixon and Mao? The full legacy, including the bringing together of the Chinese and American people, what can remain of that? How should we understand it uh, in light of especially uh, the restrictions that are placed on interacting with foreigners in China. We are delighted to have four uh, fine young scholars with us this morning who are going to present their work on aspects of these questions. We will begin with Diana Fu, who is Associate Professor of Political Science at the University of Toronto. She's also a non-resident fellow at the Brookings Institute and a member of the Public Intellectuals Program, the PIP Program, at the National Committee on US-China Relations. Her paper is titled, Is Chinese Civil Society Dead? How the US Should Navigate People-to-People -people Exchange in a New Era. And I'm sure that Diana will tell us what that new era is, what it means for all of us. She'll be followed by Tobias Smith, who is a visiting scholar in the Department of Political Science at San Francisco State University. And he will discuss his paper, uh, which is Taking Authoritarian Justice Seriously, Hostage Diplomacy, and legal reform in 21st century China. He will be followed by Austin Wong, assistant professor in the Department of Political Science at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, uh, who will be talking about uh, understanding the Milk Tea Alliance movement. This has been underreported in the United States. Fascinating phenomenon, a growing phenomenon. Austin, really glad that you're looking at this and talking with us about this today. I think it'll be new to a lot of our listeners. Uh, and then last fourth will be Audrey Wong, who is a grand strategy security and statecraft postdoctoral fellow at MIT's security studies program and also at the Harvard Kennedy School. And her paper is titled, The Diaspora and China's Foreign Influence Activities. Welcome to all four of you. Uh, we thank you for your participation in the China Fellows Program. We also wanna thank uh, the Carnegie Corporation of New York, which has made all of this possible. Uh, with that, Diana, please lead us off. Thank you very much, Robert, and to the Wilson Center for supporting such a wonderful group of uh, scholars. And I've learned a lot in the past couple of um, uh, days. So today I wanna to be talking about my Wilson Center uh, project, which is titled, uh, Is Advocacy Civil Society in China Dead? How the US Should Calibrate or Recalibrate Engagement. So my Wilson project really examines civil society in China and how policymakers should engage with this sector. And specifically, I pose the question, is advocacy civil society in China under Xi Jinping 
in uh, the last two uh, terms of Xi Jinping uh, still alive? If so, how should the United States and other powers recalibrate their engagement strategy? And this is a question that grew out of my book and research on informal labor organizations in uh, the previous era, in the Hu Win era. Whereas in this previous era, these groups and other advocacy groups were able to pursue what I called a strategy of mobilizing without the masses, the environment under Xi Jinping for civil society groups, and especially for the advocacy sector, has significantly changed. And I think we've seen all of this very clearly in headlines. We've also um, uh, have heard about uh, since 2013 that civil society has been named one of seven Western perils uh, based on an internal communique that was then leaked to the public and later known as document number nine. And in the past decade, there's been plenty of headlines. Um, I've just abstract, abstracted a few of them on here, talking about how the party's campaigns have been again, carried out against a range of advocacy sectors, civil, right, uh, civil uh, society actors, including human rights lawyers, labor activists, LGBTQ groups, pro-democracy activists in Hong Kong. And so all of this really led me to this question about the advocacy sector. And I, I, I keep saying that word and, and what I want, what I mean by it is all of these um, organizations that sort of profess to um, press for rights claims that are associated with democracies, freedom of press, freedom, freedom of, of speech, freedom of, of expression, so on and so forth. And so what I found through uh, case studies of civil society groups in the mainland and in Hong Kong is that no, this sector is not completely dismantled, but that the state, uh, the party state has been pursuing a dual response to addressing what I call the twin threats posed by the sector. And so the first response is uh, what I would see as an amputation of the sector by cutting off horizontal ties between civil society groups and imposing constraints on foreign funding and shuttering groups that cross the line. And I think amputation is a response to a particular type of mobilization threat posed by civil society, which uh, I mean that their potential to organize citizens to make rights claims as a collective from the state. But simultaneously, and what I'll uh, try to emphasize in this presentation is that the party state is also actively remolding civil society via stepping up its efforts on patriotic education campaigns in both the mainland and in Hong Kong. And I think that this latter strategy actually targets the ideological dimension of threat. And ideological governance is something that Xi Jinping um, has emphasized repeatedly and most recently in the lead up to the party centenary. So I really see um, the party state having a dual response to the twin threats that civil society uh, poses. And I think that this has direct implications by unpacking the different types of threat, the different dimensions of threat that the party state sees in advocacy civil society. This can help policymakers understand why it is that foreign organizations are, few, are viewed as so threatening in China, um, and especially coinciding with Biden's um, uh, summit of democracy, we saw an even stronger pushback by Beijing uh, which sees groups um, such as NED and a USAID as infiltrating China by bringing in Western values like freedom of the press, uh, association, so on and so forth. So um, in terms of ideological governance, the party state has always paid a particular attention to youth. And I just wanted to briefly talk about two case studies that appear in my policy report on youth-led civil society within the mainland. So these are Marxist student groups and LGBTQ groups. Both are advocacy organizations championing rights that are associated with democracies. In one case, it's labor rights and the right to associate. In another case, it's gender equity. Both are led by university age students and in both cases, the mobilization threat was actually somewhat contained because the number of people involved was fairly limited. But the ideological threat was quite significant in both cases. In the case of Marxist groups, they were nominally advocating socialism, but took it too far to the left. 
In the case of LGBTQ groups, they were threatening the party sanctioned uh, traditional gender norms. And so in response, the party state really um, successfully, I think, amputated both types of youth led uh, civil society organizations by shuttering these groups, detaining some of their leaders and holding them up as examples of undesirable forms of civic engagement. But viewed in isolation, these cases just um, simply provide a, um, a, you know, an example of repression uh, of civil society. Uh, but we should also view this in conjunction with a proactive approach to control, uh, to controlling another civil society institution, which is that of, um, that of, I just saw on here that my slides are not advancing. Um, I'm not sure what to do about that. I suppose I, it's okay. You can just listen to me. Uh, I think that's probably the, the best thing to do. Um, I can go back and see if this fixes anything. Um, I'm not getting any knobs, so I assume that it's still a problem. Um, okay, I will just keep going. <laughs> so viewed in isolation, these, um, these cases just provide evidence of repression of advocacy groups, but we should also view this in conjunction with a very proactive approach to control, to controlling, uh, okay, all right. Um, okay, so viewed in isolation, uh, these just provide a evidence of uh, repression of advocacy groups, but we should also view this in conjunction with a proactive approach to controlling another civil society institution, which are schools and universities. So the party state understands that in order to address the ideological threat, it has to invest in patriotic education. And it's done just that. I mean, I think the patriotic education campaign in the mainland China can be captured by Xi Jinping's touchstone uh, quote for reform, which is that education in the revolutionary tradition must start from childhood. That uh, And she is also widely quoted as saying that um, the party must pass on its red genes to the next generation. So in Hong Kong, I want to shift to um, some of the work that I've been doing in Hong Kong. We also see this dual response of the party state. So we know that um, in, for the 2020 national security law in Hong Kong, there's actually two specific articles, Article 9 and Article 10, that address how national security should be promoted via civil society, via social organizations, schools, and the media. And in the aftermath of the, of the law, the party state has actually moved quite swiftly to amputate the existing civil society structure in Hong Kong. And if you could see my beautiful slides that I worked on, uh, you would have see, seen the logos of about 60 organizations that um, people, that the Economist and a number of other sources have documented as um, civil society groups that have been shut down in the aftermath of the national security law. Um, in conjunction with RAs, I've been working on seeing if there were there are other groups that have not been captured, and we came up with about a total of 73 groups that I also have in a summary chart um, that was closed down in Hong Kong between July 2020 and January of 2022. And, um, and we saw by tabulating uh, and summarizing some of the characteristics of these uh, groups, we saw that the largest categories were unions, followed closely by human rights advocacy groups, pro-democracy parties, and media outlets. And all of them closed within a year or two of the passage of the national security law. The majority closed through uh, self-disbandment due to, you know, a threat and a minority from direct coercion. And in terms of the crimes charged, the majority fall into the four categories of offenses under the national security law, but not all of them. And I want to emphasize that even though 73 groups in Hong Kong may not be a large number of civil society groups, but um, by all accounts, this has had a very chilling effect on civil society actors within Hong Kong. And so lastly, I'll just talk about um, uh, how that the 
just as in mainland China, the closure of these groups in Hong Kong is just the tip of the iceberg. Because to preempt this and future generations of Hong Kong youth from becoming movement leaders, the CCP has also been launching an aggressive patriotic education campaign in Hong Kong. And, um, and this wasn't the first time, of course, the CCP tried to uh, introduce patriotic education in 2012, but faced pushback. And since the national security law, the CCP has been rehauling curriculum reform in K through 12 schools, as well as universities. And, um, and I actually have a, a chart of some of these uh, measures that they've taken that maybe what if my, when my slides start to work again, I might be able to show in the Q&A, but you can see um, that there are actually very proactive. I think what, what the type of actions that are reported in the media are the ones that are, uh, are more uh, coercive or impressive in terms of disciplining faculty or removing the, um, uh, certain reminders of Tiananmen on campus, but there are also actually proactive measures to try to integrate national security education into the existing curriculum in a way that cuts across 15 subject areas. There are school subsidies for national identity and security promotion programs in Hong Kong. There is an encouragement of student exchanges within, within the mainland as part of cultivating national identity and also Hong Kong universities are contributing to innovation or uh, in the greater Bay Area. So finally, uh, in terms of policy recalibration, I wanted to talk a little bit more about the implications of these findings for policy. And I think in short, um, the policymakers and other stakeholders seeking to engage in the advocacy sector of civil society should really be focusing a lot on youth and on the diaspora. Uh, so I have a, a couple of, um, of uh, you know, um, recommendations. One is to invest in youth-led engagement beyond formal education exchanges, to engage the mainland and Hong Kong diaspora community. And this is very important, and particularly because in this environment, some of the advocacy groups that had existed don't exist anymore. So you, we really need to, you know, so stakeholders really need to pivot. Um, to support faculty and administrators in universities outside of China to safeguard academic freedom, to reboot educational exchange programs with China, such as the Fulbright and Peace Corps. And I know there's been some um, very recent movement in Congress for, for the Fulbright program. And finally, um, on a broader level, to substitute democracy promotion rhetoric with non-ideological language for the reasons that I had mentioned before. So um, I think it was Robert who wrote in a very recent book about engaging China that um, China today is not a China that is keen on learning from the West, but even so you can't stop uh, grassroots exchanges. Uh, you can't stop people from, uh, from wanting to exchange. And so this kind of, this kind of uh, uh, sort of grassroots level exchange is really at the heart of track to diplomacy and should be promoted. Thank you very much. Thank you, Diana. Uh, we'll go now to uh, Tobias Smith, who is the Assistant Professor for the Administration of Justice at Olone College. Tobias. Thank you so much, Robert. And uh, I also want to thank the Center and uh, thank all of my co-panelists here today uh, for this great conversation. Um, exactly one year ago yesterday, the US joined 56 other countries in signing the Declaration Against Arbitrary Detention in State-to-State -state Relations. Canada, which spearheaded this initiative, was quite straightforward about its intent. The government website that hosts, the Canadian government website that hosts this uh, uh, explanation of the initiative begins, foreign nationals are being detained arbitrarily and used as bargaining chips in international relations. Although no country is named, uh, in the declaration called out specifically, it was widely understood that this was directed at China. The declaration was part of an effort uh, to resolve cases of foreign citizens detained in China. Uh, the case that most directly prompted this initiative involved uh, two Canadian nationals, Michael Spavor and Michael Kovrig, whose seizures were viewed as a direct political response to Canada's detention of Chinese citizen and Huawei CFO 
Meng Wenzhou. Uh, the cases of the so-called two Michaels were dubbed an instance of hostage diplomacy. This became quite a catchphrase. It dominated the news and it seemed to be everywhere as a slogan. But just as what goes up must come down, with the release of the two Michaels in parallel with Meng's return to China last fall, uh, the term seemed to become muted in the popular press. So we're now uh, a day, a year and a day past this, this declaration against arbitrary detention in state to state relations. And I think it's useful to assess uh, the conversation about hostage diplomacy. I want to focus in particular on the term and uh, I want to focus on what stands out in the current moment of bilateral relations um, as being both very novel and I think also strangely very trite. So first, what's novel? I think insofar as some of the dynamics of this moment and in particular, the bluntly quid pro quo nature of these detentions um, come to the fore, it seems like maybe uh, China has crossed a new line or uh, bilateral relations with China have reached a new low um, to call back to uh, Robert's earlier introduction. Um, at the same time, I think the notion of hostage diplomacy with China feels um, almost nostalgic because um, these quid pro quo cases are really part of a small number of arbitrary detentions that make up a larger um, uh, set of, uh, of cases uh, involving the PRC that go back since its inception. Um, Accusations of arbitrary detention, including of foreign citizens, um, date back half a century, and the term hostage diplomacy has been used to describe them for at least that long. So that's not necessarily new. So to go back to what is new, um, I think this sense that the detentions are solely for political bargaining purposes in policy matters, unmoored from any kind of domestic criminal law concerns is what's been pulling people's attention. The directness of the exchange implied in the recent Michael's case, its timing, in particular, its lockstep timing with Meng's case with a, um, and case developments, as well as the lack of transparency and the very public signaling by um, PRC officials around the progress of the case, all evinced a kind of blunt political ransom that previous cases of concern just hadn't had. And indeed, in another related case around Hmong, uh, one legal scholar referred to the situation not just as hostage diplomacy, but as death threat diplomacy, because of the possibility of capital sanctions in some of these cases. But I also think it's easy to exaggerate what is new here, because there's something uncanny about the recent use of the term hostage diplomacy. Detention has played a huge part in the diplomatic relationships with China for, uh, for half a century. This is true for foreign citizens, as for example, a crisis involving dozens of British diplomats who were held in Beijing during the Cultural Revolution. Uh, it's true in the post Tiananmen era, uh, as much of the political agenda at that point, particularly in US-China relations, focused on the arbitrary detention of, uh, of dissidents. And although these weren't foreign citizens, they were Chinese nationals, they were often referred to at the time in the press as cases of hostage diplomacy. I'm thinking here about Wei Jingsheng and Wang Dan. There are also a ton of cases that we don't call hostage diplomacy, but we could. So these include foreign citizens who are subject to domestic criminal law in China in ways that violate international norms, in particular, the death penalty for nonviolent offenses. So I'm thinking about Akmal Sheikh here, the British citizen who was executed in 2009, and it wasn't so much the claim that he was arbitrarily detained, but that there, there was an international concern about the use of capital punishment for him. Today, as in the past, detentions make up a broad swath of international contention with China. A few cases seem to be quid pro quo and involve direct concessions from foreign states. Um, these are the kind of cases that I think are being referred to in the Declaration Against Arbitrary Detention. But there are also so many other cases that don't quite fit. Right. We have denial of exit visas. Uh, we have detentions that appear to put pressure on individuals, but not states, and detentions um, that are intended to repatriate assets. There are cases where foreigners seem to be singled out for harsh treatment, 
but not with any particular signal to a foreign actor. And there are a huge number of political cases involving Chinese citizens that stand out as international concerns, even though the detentions are motivated entirely by Chinese domestic politics. This includes, of course, dissidents, and it includes whole classes of people, notably Uyghurs, um, and it also includes uh, those who touch on elite domestic politics, like the whereabouts of tennis star Peng Shui. So there's an ambiguity around the two valences of this term hostage diplomacy. Have we crossed a Rubicon or is this the status quo? I think the answer to this question and where should we should be focusing our policy attention is not so much on the attributes of the cases themselves, which I think have varied less than we might suppose in aggregate over the last few, few uh, decades. And I think we should be focused more on the bigger shifts regarding China in the 21st century. I wanna note two here. First is the decline in bi bilateral dialogues, notably human rights dialogues. And the other is the reshaping of Chinese domestic policy of governing through law. So in some, some sense, the context has changed more than the cases. Let me say first a few words about the dialogues. Many of you listening will probably track these closely in the 90s. Um, in the 90s, uh, the US in particular held more than a dozen human rights dialogues with China and plenty of other kinds of dialogues. Many other countries did as well. These dialogues were widely panned as unsuccessful, sometimes referred to as dialogues of the deaf, but they were also a forum, or I should say maybe a frame for elevating prisoner cases and policy concessions in the same conversation. They were in some sense actual hostage diplomacy. That is uh, a forum for the discussion of cases in, of concern as politically related to larger policy matters. So now these dialogues have dried up in large part because China has risen and walked away from the table. But I think one reason that these cases, the current wave of cases seems novel is because they would have been discussed in other forums in the past. And as those, those forums have, have gone away, we're now seeing them discussed more bluntly in the popular media and by state representatives and mouthpieces rather than in, um, in over the table dialogue. I think there's been a second big shift as well. And this one has definitely not gotten enough policy attention. And this is that over the last decade, the Xi administration has launched major changes in China's orientation towards law in general and criminal justice in particular. These changes have fallen under the slogan of governing in accordance with the law or governing by law. In fact, this movement is neither a move towards traditional rule of law as we understand it in the West, nor I think a simple black is white, up is down rejection of the law um, or uh, simple propaganda. Rather, over the last decade, China has developed a comprehensive system of social management through rule-based mechanisms. And this process has involved strengthening criminal procedures for defendants in routine criminal cases. This is actually a step forward in addressing arbitrary detention in the average case for the average citizen. At the same time, the Xi administration has massively overhauled procedures for what we might call uh, non-routine or exceptional cases, including domestic political cases. The biggest reform in this process was the establishment of the National Supervisory Law and, a, and an accompanying National Supervisory Commission, which is a state body that has the same standing as the Supreme People's Court. It's effectively co-equal with, with the judicial branch. The law effectively creates a formal parallel track for discipline of party members and state workers, moving at least 100 million people outside the traditional legal system. And by people, I mean, um, Chinese citizens. This process is neither arbitrary because it does follow rules, nor lawful because it does not comport with Chinese criminal procedure law or the Chinese constitution. So this shift in domestic criminal justice practice is important because it highlights the degree to which the Xi administration is attempting to impose a comprehensive system of discipline on China's political class. Recent hostage diplomacy cases involving foreign nationals are therefore not just criminal cases that do not comport with international or domestic law, but they're also political cases that fall outside the purview of China's new political discipline apparatus.
I think we need to pay more attention to that fact. I could go on at great length about this shift, but I think I'll stop here because it looks like I'm about out of time. Closing, I just want to say again that I think the recent hostage diplomacy cases are, um, are part of a continuum, a long tradition of um, so-called hostage diplomacy with China dating back half a century. I think they stand out because previous mechanisms for discussing cases of concern have broken down. And they also stand out because China's domestic political criminal justice system has reoriented under them in the last decade. So resolving these cases going forward, I think, is going to um, require attention not just to the specifics of the cases, but to these two larger contextual shifts. Okay, that's what I've got. Thank you. Thank you, Tobias. Uh, over to Austin Wong. Okay, let me share my slide to see if I have a good luck here. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. This is Austin Wang from, from UNLV. So today I'm happy to be here and share my research project, Understanding the Milky Alliance Movement, which is generously uh, supported by the Wilson Center. Okay. So everyone loves milk tea, who doesn't, right? But what is the Milk Tea Alliance? How could a cup of tea help us enhance our understanding of China and democracy in East Asia? So the story began in April 2020 from this Instagram post. A Thailand actor's girlfriend posts her selfie on her Instagram account. A comment praised her for dressing like a Chinese girl. But she corrected that, well, this style is Taiwanese, not Chinese. So you can imagine that this reply angered many Chinese fans. So they request the actors and her girlfriend to apologize and citing the One China Principle. So many Thailand fans start to dispute with the Chinese fan on Twitter. And this, the China factor behind this dispute quickly drew attention from many Twitter users in Hong Kong, Taiwan, and many other countries in East Asia. So some people start to suggest that, well, countries around the China all love milk tea, and they all dislike the China. So they suggest that, well, people should form a milk tea alliance counter against Chi the expansion of China's ideology and China's narrative of globalization. So the hashtag, the milk tea alliance became popular in 2020. And many people start to use this hash hashtag to exchange their information or experience. So in late 2020, we start to see this hashtag appear in many offline events especially during the repression in Hong Kong, Thailand, and Myanmar. We can see that the activists use this hashtag to draw international attention or for mobilization. Okay. So far, the story seems too good to be true, right? An Instagram photo gradually become a cross-country collaboration to contain China. Really? So when we review the story of the Milky Alliance, there are two research questions emerged. The first question is that, well, who really participate in this multi alliance movement online? Right? So do we really start to form a cross-country collaboration against China? Right? And the second is that, well, when people use this multi alliance hashtag, do people really always focus on the anti-China narrative or do people shift their attention later? Right? So to study these two research questions, I collaborate with a research team at National Taiwan University. The team download all tweets with the Milk Tea Alliance hashtag on Twitter every day. And overall, the team archive about 3 million tweets with the Milk Tea Alliance hashtag. So here is the daily number of the Milk Tea Alliance tweets by day in 2020. So the movement start in April 2020 and we archive all tweets till the end of 2020. And as you can see, the Milk Tea Alliance movement is not a one-shot movement. So there are several waves in 2020. However, as you also can see in these slides, the, each wave did not last long. We then categorized the 3 million tweets by the language used and by the self-report geolocation. And under both methods, the Milk Tea Alliance tweets written in Thai and the Milk Tea Alliance tweet, tweet by the Thailand user account for more than half 
of all tweets in our archive. In comparison, other assumed Milky Alliance member contribute to a much smaller proportion of the Milky Alliance tweets. And surprisingly, we noticed that the Twitter users in the United States actually contribute to a considerable proportion of the Milky Alliance tweets. So the next question is, what do people use these Milky Alliance tweets, right? So we use the key needs analysis to analyze what people discuss when they tweet the Milky Alliance across time. And so far we find we have we find two trends. The first trend is about the content. In early stage of the Milky Alliance movement, people, Milky Alliance members generally discuss everything about China. The one China principle, the South China Sea, the one bell run road, the Mekong Dam, and the repression in Hong Kong. In late 2020, however, the spotlight gradually shift to the well-being of the protester in Thailand, in Hong Kong, and in Myanmar. So the second finding is about the language. When people talk about the China in early 2020, Twitter users are much more likely to use English to exchange their opinion about the China. But, but in late 2020, when people pay more attention to the protester, people are much likely to use their mother, mother tongue, such as the Thai or Chinese. So we then zoom in to two periods in 2020. One is in April 2020, when the Milky Alliance movement began. And the second is October 2020, when the Milky Alliance movement reached the maximum. And then we use the, we extract all of the concurrent hashtag when people tweet about the Milky Alliance, and then we analyze the relation of this hashtag. And basically the refining is similar to the previous slide. In early 2020, when people talk about the Milky Alliance, the topic is central, is centered around China, such as the such as the One China Principle or the One Bill One Road. But when it moved to the uh, the later 2020, then then people pay more attention to the protester, to the well-being of the protester, and they are much likely to tweet in Thai and in Chinese, and they focus more about the human rights. So in 2021, I did two additional analysis to see whether the Milky Alliance movement continued. So I did two analysis. One is on July, 2021, which the repression in Myanmar and Thailand reached the maximum. And the other is in December, 2021, because of the, there is a removal of the pillar of Shen in Hong Kong, right? So under both period, I have two findings. The first is that the number of Milky Alliance has twists is much smaller compared to the similar event in 2020. And the second is that under this both period, the United States actually contribute more tweets than many other Milky Alliance countries. The US play an even bigger role in 2021 compared to 2020. So what is the conclusion of this finding? Three points. The first, the surge and decline of this Milky Alliance movement generally reflect the political challenge faced by the Thailand people. Well, other countries also contribute to the Milky Alliance tweets, but they, can ex they cannot explain too much on the change in the number of the Milky Alliance tweets, at least online. Second, at the beginning of the Milky Alliance movement, people talk more about the anti-China sentiment in English, but when time goes by, their attention gradually shifts to the protester, to the pro-human rights and narrative. And in the end, we noticed that the activists use this Milky Alliance hashtag as a channel of information consumption. The activists use this hashtag to learn from each other, to learn what is going on in other countries. However, the activists did not use this hashtag to mobilize people across country effectively. So what are the policy implications to the United States? So we have two policy implications. The first is that well, these three million Milky Alliance tweets reflect the need for a platform for pursuing democracy in East Asia. In the early stage of the Milky Alliance movement, people in Thailand, Hong Kong, Taiwan, and, and India, they, they gradually form a counter argument against China's narrative of globalization, such as the argument against the one bill one road, the argument against the one China principle. However, the hashtag itself cannot serve as a reliable platform 
right? Especially a hashtag cannot work for for an organization. It, it's not good for resource allocation. So therefore, I suggest that this three million hashtag really reflect that people in East Asia they need a reliable and informative platform to exchange their experience and to form the narrative. And the second policy implication is that the role of the United States is really underestimated throughout the whole Milky Alliance hashtag uh, movement. As I shared before, we find that your Twitters in the United States actually contribute to a considerable proportion of all Milky Alliance tweets. So when I check all of these accounts in the United States, I noticed that many of these accounts have very strong connection to both the United States and the Milky Alliance country. So in other words, the United States physically serve as a hub for this Milky Alliance member to have a chance to co collaborate with each other or even to meet face to face. Right? So people in East Asia, when they pursue democracy, they need a platform. And the United States is physically a platform right here. Right? So I can imagine that the United States can make the best use of this unique opportunity to help foster uh, the democracy in East Asia. And that's all I can share. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Austin. Uh, let's go now to Audrey Wong. Audrey. Hi, everyone. Thanks for, for being here. And thanks to the Bolton Center for giving um, us this opportunity to share our research. I've learned a lot um, from the other panels and, and from my panel, fellow panelists. So I don't have slides, but I'm just going to speak briefly today about uh, some of my ongoing research on the role of diaspora communities uh, in the context of China's foreign policy. So amidst growing concern over authoritarian foreign influence operations, there has been renewed debate over how such governments are attempting to co-op uh, certain individuals and certain groups. And unsurprisingly, diaspora communities uh, are often perceived by host countries, uh, such as the United States, as, as potentially unfriendly agents. Uh, but diaspora is also viewed by home governments, uh, such as China, uh, as a natural resource to pursue its political and, and security interests. So understanding the role of diaspora statecraft, especially in the context of an you know, increasingly tense uh, US-China relationship, has important implications, not just for, for geopolitical competition, but also the, the healthy functioning of democratic systems and multicultural societies. And there have been several you know, recent examples of ethnic Chinese individuals being in, in the spotlight, where right? you have the, the FBI director in 2018 describing China as a, you know, not just a whole of government, but a whole of society threat. You have the Department of Justice, um, China Initiative, um, that's supposed to be you know, targeting uh, foreign spies, but has been criticized for targeting scientists of, of ethnic Chinese descent. Right, more prominent case, an MIT professor was arrested and charged last year for, for hiding links with Chinese government institutions before his case was eventually dropped uh, last month. And of course, we've seen a lot of media reporting and alarm over, um, you know, over uh, Chinese student uh, associations on university campuses, uh, you know, protesting Dalai Lama visit, uh, you know, ripping down posters that, that support Hong Kong pro-democracy protests, uh, or you know, protesting, objecting to talks by, by Uyghur uh, activists. And so I'm just going to talk a little bit about how China's uh, about China's policies towards the diaspora, uh, its use of propaganda narratives to try to shape how the diaspora, um, the diaspora attitudes and behavior, and talk also about the implications for for channels of political influence. Um, before before going further, I just want to highlight an important point, which is uh, that the notion of the concept of diaspora is you know can be highly contested. Uh, it's a concept that's also constructed by, by you know, the Chinese government, by, by host countries, including the United States, and of course, by the diaspora communities themselves, right? So this, there are plenty of uh, divergences, a lot of diversity within diaspora communities in terms of country of origin, you know, level of integration um, in, in host, host societies and level of affinity with, with the you know, so-called homeland, right? And, and so these are people and, and lives we're talking about, right? People you know, with human agency, and all these factors do come into play in and shaping China's ability to actually use the diaspora as tools of foreign policy. So certainly not all diaspora activity is on behalf of foreign governments. And in fact, as I'll discuss briefly, right, a lot of times the overt attempts to try to mobilize or engage diaspora uh, may in fact backfire. 
So first, why does the Chinese government care about, about the diaspora, about diaspora communities, right? First is uh, kind of relating back to, to the notion of uh, consolidating um, internal stability, right? If you have diaspora communities abroad, there are, there's increased exposure to foreign ideas, for foreign, um, you know, international values, liberal values, right? And this is seen as posing a threat to the Chinese Communist Party's uh, domestic rule. Uh, and so this calls for, you know, greater, you know, more overseas propaganda and control where you try to, you know, rally patriotism, rally nationalism and stamp out uh, criticism, right? So the, the goal here is to build diaspora loyalty while constraining, you know, anti-CCP or, or constraining pro-democracy movements that can endanger the regime's grip on power. Right, for example, after Tiananmen Square Massacre in 1989, right, there were propaganda efforts to try to win over the diaspora and sort of promote uh, the Chinese government's narratives. Um, there's also increasing emphasis on, uh, in recent years, on using the diaspora to promote China's foreign policy interests and try to expand uh, China's global influence. We have top level Chinese officials, including the President Xi Jinping and, and you know, top diplomat Yang Ziechi, right, calling for overseas Chinese to tell China's story well, to promote positive narratives, uh, you know, work more closely with, with embassies and consulates abroad, um, and also promote diplomatic goals, you know, such as, such as the Belt and Road Initiative. Right. And, and so in the Chinese government's policies sort of diaspora, right, whether it's for domestic political reasons or foreign policy reasons, right, the mess messaging really aims to, to blur the lines between Chinese nationals and those of ethnic Chinese descent. Right. And so the idea is to push a conception of an overseas Chinese as having an inevitable sort of affinity or belonging to the homeland. I you know, read the party regardless of their individual context. Um, and so in this way, right, Chinese government's policies do intentionally homogenize and, and instrumentalize its diaspora communities. Right. And, and sort of thinking about the role of the Chinese diaspora abroad, you know, has has, you know, unsurprisingly become increasingly significant, right? When you have a lot of recent waves of migrants with Chinese students studying abroad, uh, Chinese Chinese business people uh, working abroad, right? The sort of human capital flows as, as China's economy has grown. Um, you know, has really expanded the potential significance of diaspora communities. Uh, and technological changes, right, the internet, social media has also facilitated, you know, home government's ability to engage the diaspora and to even, you know, monitor their, their activities abroad. Right, so there are many ways that the Chinese government, you know, has tried to engage and shape the behavior of, of the Chinese diaspora, right, through financial uh, incentives to, to Korea, incentives, political sort of uh, connections, um, you know, also certainly through coercive methods, uh, through sort of patri patriotic homeland tours. And, and one tool that I want to zoom in on today is, is the use of diaspora uh, targeted propaganda. So in a paper that I uh, co-authored with Patrick Chester of, of, of NYU, well, what we did was we scraped uh, WeChat articles and we used a text analysis method called word embeddings to look at the differences in narratives that are used by, by government uh, subscription accounts versus privately run subscription accounts um, that are popular among Chinese diaspora in the United States. And what we argue is that diaspora targeted propaganda is a, so it's kind of the information and narratives that, and rhetoric that's used by uh, the Chinese government or government linked accounts, right, really aims to drive a wedge between diaspora communities and host countries, right? And, and they do that by emphasizing sort of identity or, or in social cultural differences that are particularly salient issues uh, for the diaspora. So what this means is that as Chinese government propaganda uh, strategically frames host country issues such as racial discrimination and violence as being targeted specifically uh, at, at diaspora communities. So in the context of the United States, right, that, that means heightened coverage of anti-Asian hate crimes, um, how Asian communities are isolated and dismissed, right? You see, you see sort of articles that, that talk about um, discrimination against you know, Chinese people during COVID, right, you know, not allowing them to enter restaurants, harassing those who wear masks, right, and, you know, referencing sort of these ideas of deep rooted legacies of racism uh, in the United States, right, the murder of Vincent Chin, uh, you know, Wall Street Journal headline, you know, calling China Asia sick men, so kind of using these, this sort of framing to, to highlight kind of the cleavages and, the, you know, the differences between diaspora, Chinese diaspora um, and, and host society in the United States. So now thinking a little bit more about you know, how channels of, of diaspora influence in, in host countries, right? You can think about it as, as in three um, main categories. The first is agenda setting, and you know, which diaspora can, can influence what sort of policy issues and ideas get discussed, right? Especially, you know, things that are salient to the homeland, uh, you know, Taiwan, Hong Kong, um, Xinjiang, uh, you know, territory disputes. 
right? And second channel is, is discourse framing where, where diaspora could potentially shape public and elite discussions um, in line with the home state's interests uh, and rhetoric. And, and the third main channel is, is also, you know, acting as, as political brokers, right? So, so kind of brokering, acting as intermediaries or facilitators, organizers to link, uh, you know, homeland interest groups or diaspora groups, right, to um, those in power in the host country. And this is, you know, can be particularly influential in, in places where, you know, sometimes where politicians don't know very much about, you know, the, the Chinese communities or the Asian communities, right? And this is an opportunity for sometimes for, for you know, certain diaspora individuals to be able to step in and sort of claim to be, be sort of um, a liaison between, between uh, these communities and, and sort of broader, broader society and, and with sort of the broader political system, right? And we've had examples you know, in, in Australia and New Zealand, for example, where, you know, you have had, uh, you know, Chinese businessmen who, you know, later found to be linked to the Chinese Communist Party, right, who have been uh, campaign donors, who have, uh, you know, met with, with high-level leaders in these countries, who have served as political advisors, uh, and shaped, you know, public elite statements on controversial issues, such as Tibet or, or the South China Sea. And, and so, you know, for thinking from a foreign policy perspective, I, I think, you know, kind of thinking about, about when, you know, how countries such as China try to, try to use diaspora in foreign policy, right? I think the informal nature and plausible deniability of, of these tools sort of make it really hard to, to assess and, and forestall, right? It's harder to detect sort of, um, you know, what's going on because a lot of these activities are conducted in more private domains. So it's more difficult for um, you know countries for host countries to really identify who the actors are, who's you know actually acting on behalf of the Chinese government versus not you know and and sort of what Chinese government the extent of Chinese government involvement is. So, so there's a lot of uncertainty, and that makes it harder for for host countries to to respond you know without over escalating. Um, or, you know, and there's a relative lack of, um, you know, proportional response options, right? So you can think about it, you know, a little bit, um, you know, parallel with, you know, say China's use of, of fishermen or, you know, maritime militia in the South China Sea to, to try to assert territory claims is sort of gray area where it's harder for, for the targets to, to respond. And of course, you know, the, the, the sort of liberal way that China often, you know, conducts its foreign policy um, and, you know, an extraterritorial reach, right, definitely threatens to adversely affect um, the healthy functioning of democratic political systems uh, and also undermines liberties of these uh, varied and diverse uh, diaspora communities, right? If you have pro-Beijing uh, positions that are amplified, right, drawing out turn of viewpoints, um, you know, this ties into sort of China's broader uh, Wolf World diplomacy pro propaganda campaigns. And so it distorts sort of the perceived representation of interests and incentives um, around, around these uh, important political issues, right? And, and so, you know, if I talked about the use of wedge narratives, right, th these, these sort of um, trends, you know, might exacerbate social and political tensions in host countries, um, you know, where diaspora individuals who, you know, maybe disagree with China's positions are bullied into silence, even while facing, you know, greater suspicion from, from host country. Right, especially when, when you know, China doesn't necessarily play by the same rules, right? That makes it harder for, for liberal democratic uh, societies to, to sort of um, uh, respond appropriately, right? And that, so that leaves these diaspora communities caught up in, in this uh, great power competition. I'm just going to conclude by noting that the effectiveness of Chinese efforts to, to mobilize the diaspora is right, still very much an open question, right? These communities are not passive. There are differences in their views of the Chinese government that may often actually reject um, Beijing's narratives or Beijing's efforts to, to reach out um, or, you know, to engage with, with them, right? And I think paradoxically, uh, you know, China's effort to more actively or overtly, uh, you know, mobilize the diaspora, right, tends to raise the hackles of host countries. Uh, and many times it sparked, uh, many cases has really sparked kind of longer term blowback and overreaction. Um, Australia is one example, right, where China's perceived foreign influence activities have led to very strong elite and societal, societal reactions um, and, you know, led to a more, much more hawkish turn in Australia's foreign policy um, um, towards China, right? And if, you know, you're trying to you know, you know, sort of in a coercive way, engage with diaspora, right? This also threatens to 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 marginalize them, um, you know, making them sort of victims as opposed to empowering them as agents of influence. Uh, and finally, you know, I, I just just to conclude on a more policy uh, implication note, right? Um, I think overreaction in host countries, right, singling out diaspora groups as untrustworthy or as outsiders, could plausibly drive, you know, these communities to sort of consolidate their identity or, you know, feel feel more distant from host country and feel closer to to the homeland, right? And so to respond effectively, 
right? It's important that policies to prevent China's targeting of the diaspora abroad, right? Need to also avoid, you know, sowing for the ethnic divisions and, and feeding, you know, back into the Chinese Communist Party's uh, narratives about, about these issues. But I'll stop here and, and looking forward to, to the discussion. Okay, thank you, Audrey. For members of the audience, if you would like to ask a question uh, to any or all of our panelists, please send it to asia at wilsoncenter.org. Again, it's asia at wilsoncenter, one word, dot org. Uh, but first, I would like to give our four panelists a chance to uh, ask each other questions and to respond to each other's presentations. There are an awful lot of common threads between these themes, uh, perhaps the most striking of which is the uh, action of and the agency of diaspora communities, uh, which Audrey has just touched on. Austin has shown, although you didn't mention this specifically, but I think it's pretty clear that an awful lot of the American Milk Tea Alliance members are members of diaspora communities in the United States. Uh, Chinese Americans, Chinese Australians, Chinese Brits, far more likely to be taken hostage uh, in mainland China as business people or journalists. And they have also been very active in building up civil society organizations and NGOs uh, that bring together uh, Chinese and Americans. So uh, this is a group of people, very diverse, several groups of people really, uh, that it has played a key role throughout the engagement era, uh, but it, which is also now under extraordinary pressure not only within and from China, but in some cases within the United States and other host countries. So why don't I first um, open it up to the four of you and see if you have any questions for each other or responses uh, to each other's presentations. And there's no need to raise your hand, just uh, the four of you un unmute yourselves and jump right in. So I'm just picking up on, on, on that thread um, that Robert just raised about the diaspora, something that I've been thinking about as we've been, um, you know, encouraged to think about policy recommendations is channels for communicating and engaging the diaspora community, um, various different ones. And the particular challenge that I have in mind is um, basically how do you engage with diaspora communities that are mostly, uh, you know, speak Chinese. There's many, so I'm in Toronto and many, many diaspora uh, people here don't they prefer Chinese to English in terms of getting their information. Um, a lot of them are getting most of their information from WeChat. And so I think this poses a very real um, technical challenge, I think, for um, stakeholders who want to engage with this community but are faced with the technical challenge of how to do so in a through a channel that is not directly controlled by the, by the Chinese government. Um, and that's something that I haven't thought through how to do, I haven't gotten an answered yet, but that's something that has occurred to me um, uh, to maybe interview more people as, 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 as this project develops to figure out how to actually engage um, those communities. And it may be that not all of our listeners know what WeChat is. Uh, WeChat is the Chinese sort of Uber app uh, through which uh, people in China communicate with each other, they get their entertainment. They make payments there, and it is very widely used among Chinese immigrant communities throughout North America and around the world, uh, which has sometimes put it on Capitol Hill's agenda, because we have really for the first time this absolutely vital subset of North Americans, you know, Chinese Canadians, Chinese Americans, absolutely key building block of our society, whose primary mode of communications is monitored by and perhaps censored by what is now seen as a hostile power on American soil. So how do we how do we frame and understand that? Is that a threat to the United States? Maybe, uh, but is curtailing it uh, an attack on freedoms of speech? Uh, so that is what that is what WeChat is. I think that Diana has has characterized it very accurately. Communities, large communities, are very dependent on it. Any other thoughts on this from other panelists? Yeah, I guess I, I don't have a, a you know a clear answer, and I think Diana obviously raised a very important and challenging challenging question. Um, I mean, I would say that you know I think 
like since Trump's election, right, there has been also a lot of rise of sort of these Asian American civil society where, where you know, these Chinese American groups are also trying to combat disinformation on, on WeChat. Um, and so I think, you know, optimistically speaking, there are sort of some civil society resources in the United States and I'm sure in, in Canada and other countries, right, that, that I think the U.S. government, the host country government needs to kind of think, you know, think about reaching out to these community, to these, you know, civil society groups and, and kind of learning, I think, just getting more information, more awareness about the landscape of, you know, WeChat groups or an informational landscape. And, and I think kind of even just getting the information and being aware of, you know, what's going on in these communities, right? That would be a really valuable first step and and you know for, as a foundation for the actual you know pol policies and specific ways ways of engagement but i think just raising awareness about the diversity and who these stakeholders are was is a critical first step that i think in many you know many, many politicians don't don't know very much about right in australia you have uh, you know, they're, they're like, oh, there's this growing over overseas Chinese community, we need to sort of reach out to them and they end up sort of sort of falling on these political brokers who are, you know, linked to the Chinese Communist Party and present a certain, certain sort of, uh, you know, image or position that may not be representative of, of the broader community. Austin, am I, am I right? You, know, you, you talked about uh, American members of the Milk Tea Alliance, but you didn't say who they were. Are these... Uh, Asian American communities are these Thais, uh, people of Taiwanese descent in the United States. Can you tell us a little bit more about who they are? Well, actually, it's hard to tell because uh, because of course when, I, when I look at their their Twitter account, so I can see that they have strong connection. They tweet a lot about um, what 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 it was happening in many countries in East Asia, and they have a lot of followers and friends from some countries in East Asia. However, sometimes they hide their real name, so I cannot identify who they really are. Some of them I can see there. The graduate students in the United States. And some of them, they are activists, but now they're in the United States. But for, for, for many others, I simply don't know. Yeah, you know, they, they just hide their real name. They, they don't show their real profile, but it's just an account with a lot of followers. Yeah, so yeah, so that, that is all I know about this. Tobias, we have a we have a question in for you. Uh, how much pressure should the United States government put on China to restrain from hostage diplomacy? Uh, and how might that be done? Do we do we have any leverage? Uh, does China think, I mean, another way of asking the question, you know, China released the two Michaels, but they seem to have achieved their goals. Is the lesson learned that hostage diplomacy works? Do we expect to see more of this? Or is this something that we think we'll see China back off from? And can we exert any pressure here? That's a great question. Um, I, uh, I think that the the, um, the query is is right. First, that um, it does seem that uh, in the narrow case of the two Michaels, that hostage diplomacy worked for some some version of uh, of resolve the situation. So that's a concern. Um, I can I continue to think that hostage diplomacy is a small part of the overall uh, issue of political detentions in China. Um, I. I don't have a lot of evidence. I mean, we're, we have such a small sample that it's hard to know um, whether it's growing. Um, as to um, how to avert it, uh, it has been pointed out that uh, the case of the Michaels in particular is about not exerting hostage diplomacy directly on the US, but on allies. So there does seem to be a bit of um, uh, 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 intentionality on the Chinese side about which countries are being targeted and not necessarily directly targeting the US. And my understanding is that part of the strategy to avert this is to coalition build. Uh, and I think that that uh, makes sense uh, as a strategy, um, as a strategy more broadly to identify this as a pattern rather than negotiate over specific cases. Dan, a question about uh, NGOs and especially support for NGO activity uh, in greater China, including Hong Kong, but mainland China. You know, two, two concerns about that. And if I understood your, your policy recommendations, you still see some channels for civil society cooperation here. But two questions. The first is that if uh, Americans are involved in cooperation or funding or support of some form for NGOs in Hong Kong or mainland China. Is there a, uh, a problem that, that this gives the Chinese Communist Party fodder to say that 
this is the American black hand trying to manipulate these societies to or the, the civil society, you know, to harm China. Is, is there a risk there? Then the second question is that if we support uh, an NGO, say in Hong Kong, is there a moral hazard problem in that we are encouraging them to take stances, perhaps very brave stances, stances in which they, they really believe ardently, uh, but for which they could pay a very high price while we, writing checks from the United States, uh, pay no price at all. Uh, do you have concerns along those lines or does that overstate the Chinese government's antagonism to international NGOs? Um, yeah, thank you, Robert. Um, I'm just trying to reboot and see if you can now sort of see my policy recommendation slide. I see um, decalibrating engagement. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Um, okay, so I think I wanted to clarify that because my suggestion was not necessarily that um, we should be supporting uh, groups that are on the ground right now because of the particular risks that you so um, that you clearly articulated right that um, whenever the Chinese government has already put out a number of documents saying that the um, youth-led movement, the pro-democracy movement in Hong Kong in the first place was driven by the black hand of foreign involvement. And so to continue to support people on the ground, I think poses a very uh, a very real risk for, for, for activists that are engaged, especially uh, following the national security law. And so I think that's why I um, have included a number of recommendations that do not involve, for now, I think it's best to sit tight in terms of directly uh, supporting groups on the ground. But I think that in the long term, that uh, it would be worthwhile to involve and invest in youth-led engagement, including cultural and learning programs that don't have to particularly be about politics or about activism, but to kind of uh, expose the learning programs that can, can expose youth as they are being exposed to patriotic education in Hong Kong and in China, that they're given other channels of learning, other channels uh, of, with which to be exposed to other types of uh, values that um, increasingly are, they are not being exposed to in, on the ground in China. Um, and secondly, to be able to engage again in the diaspora community. And that particular reason is because a lot of the um, dissident networks are actually um, abroad now. And so I think that presents a political opportunity for stakeholders to engage with them and to also um, support and reboot um, educational exchange programs that, um, that had been going on but had seized under the Trump administration and I think there's some movement right now with Fulbright but there could be more and then finally to sort of um, as another sort of risk um, risk hedging uh, uh, tactic or, or strategy is to substitute this talk of democracy promotion which very much recalls um, an era where China, well, China, the Chinese government is still uh, very worried about um, uh, the color, you know, the lessons that they learned from the color revolutions. And so to substitute this kind of democracy promotion rhetoric with non-ideological language. So these are uh, some of the tenets of the policy recommendations that I had. I wonder if I could put the, a little, little pressure on that from, from two angles. You know, you suggest uh, some youth interactions through NGOs that don't have any overt political content that are depoliticized, but that also expose Chinese youth to an alternate set of values from the ones that they'll get through patriotic education in Chinese schools. Aren't, aren't the Chinese, isn't the Chinese government sort of hip to that move? Isn't there so much skepticism now? Uh, such a strong assumption that NGOs are sort of a fifth column designed to find and exploit a weak Chinese underbelly, that the Chinese government would, would see that and, and wouldn't necessarily let that one slide. And at the other end, if you did something that was so depoliticized, mightn't you run into American critics who would say that in doing something so sort of anodyne and, and kumbaya and drained of substance that we're actually playing China's game and you know, undermining the whole idea of civil society? I know that's a really hard question, but uh, I'm sure you've thought about it, so I thought I'd throw it at you. 
I thought I think that's more of a, a comment, uh, Robert, than, than a question in a, in a sense. And I agree with you that these things are it's a very hard balance to strike between um, between being too anodyne and um, and actually doing something that just won't fly on the ground. And I think that um, I don't have the answers for that just at this moment. I hope to be interviewing more policy, more people who are actually engaged on the ground to see the feasibility of some of these ideas. But I do think that in the long term, um, the, the, the headlines that we see about repressing civil society is just one part of a broader strategy to reshape civil society in China. And I think that a lot, of, a lot more attention needs to be paid to the um, to sort of the long term game of uh, ensure the sort of patriotic education so as to ensure that people don't think about the norms of participation in the same way that they do now they don't think about civic uh, going out to the streets as a form of uh, 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 political engagement uh, as an acceptable form of political engagement I think that kind of um, the measures that I had described that the Chinese government is doing with respect to remolding civil society through learning institutions in Hong Kong is really something to watch for. And it's really to something to design more programs around to try to expose the future generations of youth who don't know about umbrella movement, don't know about the anti-extradition bill, don't know about that kind of history, um, have exposure to, to uh, alternative norms of engagement. Austin, um, question about the Milk Tea Alliance going forward. You mentioned that it tends to get active in waves, depending on things that are happening in Thailand or other parts of the Asia Pacific region. Does it remain a sort of a, a nascent potential network that can be tapped by activists whenever events of a certain sort occur? And if so, what sort of events are, is, are going to get the Milk Tea Alliance engaged and excited? What are their core values do you think if if any you know if there's something that lasts and persists that can be activated about this going forward what what is what is the nature of that how should we think about it um as we look to the future yeah so what i what i find based on my data based on my data set is that well at the beginning it seemed to me that uh, many military alliance members they, they actively learn from each other for example when at the beginning when the thailand twitter users and the china twitter users start to dispute about the, the thailand actor's girlfriend's instagram many thailand users start to learn what the china one china principle really is and they learn a lot from the users uh, in hong kong and in taiwan yeah, and also during the repressions in thailand and in hong kong many milky alliance members also actively learn what was happening in hong kong what is happening in thailand so that they can learn some technique uh, about the protest and a technique about the online mobilization through this country but however with time goes by i gradually noticed that well when so especially in late 2020 when people tweet the milky alliance it seems like they they know something was happening in other countries and then they translate what was happening in other country to their own mother tongue and then spread the information about what happened in their in their own mother tongue. So, so it seems to me that they become from discussion into a simply a learning process. So I saw so that's a reason why I conclude that in the later stage of multi alliance, they start to use this hashtag as the information consumption channel instead of a, a, a mobilization. And so so I can imagine that in the future, if we see any new new trend of the military alliance wave it is very likely that people in certain country or in, in certain region they want to learn something from uh, from what, what was happening in other country instead of a cross-country mobilization uh, but because at least in my observations in what, what happened in thailand yeah, so that, that, that is what people in thailand nowadays they use nowadays the protest st st still continue in thailand but the thailand user they, they when they use the military alliance they only use this, this hashtag to inform other thailand users what was happening in Hong Kong, what had happened in Myanmar. But instead, they, they didn't use the hashtag to mobilize the people in other place to help to extend to support the Thailand. Yeah, so it's no longer the case right now. Yeah. Audrey, question about uh, a major diaspora issue. I know there's a lot of concern about this in the China policy community. And this has to do with the position of uh, Chinese American communities in particular as US-China relations get worse, uh, and it appears that they could get you know, quite a bit worse. We've seen during uh, COVID uh, a resurrection of sort of always present uh, anti-Asian racism in the United States, some and in some cases violent. Uh, 
because of characterizations of the pandemic, uh, primarily from the Trump administration. Uh, you, and I think all of you know that history over the past two years. But going forward, as the U.S.-China relationship gets worse, even accurate descriptions of a worsening relationship run the risk of feeding some of these attitudes uh, toward Chinese American citizens, right? So are, do you see these communities as caught? I mean, the, the, we've seen this, especially in the case of the, the China Initiative, where there seems to have been considerable racial profiling of Chinese American academics and, and many community advocacy organizations like C100 have pushed back against that. So what kinds of pressures do you worry about coming from within the United States? And then second, something that you alluded to, which is pressure from China, because China does in fact try to exercise influence through diaspora communities. And both Li Keqiang and Xi Jinping have made repeated statements about how Chinese all over the world should help to achieve the rejuvenation of the great Chinese nation, sort of once a Chinese, always a Chinese, this kind of language. Can the diaspora communities push back against China, Xi Jinping, and say, back off? How do you, how do you see this position? Am, am I right that it's getting more precarious, or it, do you think that's an exaggeration? Yeah, I, I think you characterize the situation quite quite accurately, right, where you have the Chinese Chinese Americans sort of caught, caught in between uh, sort of suspicious or skeptical uh, host country, United States, or you know, but the U.S. government. Um, while kind of being increasingly coerced or pressured by, by the Chinese government or being viewed as, as a tool of uh, foreign policy or, or foreign uh, influence, right? So I think in regards to sort of the, the, the challenges uh, within the United States, um, I think the baseline sort of re recommendation implication is really to, to really avoid this sort of kind of whole society um, you know, very alarmist and, and sweeping rhetoric, right? You know that that sort of kind of lumps all Chinese Americans or Chinese diaspora under under one umbrella, right? And that you know, in fact, I think feeds into or kind of reinforces what the Chinese Communist Party is trying to say, which is that all overseas Chinese are somehow you know inherently linked or feel some sort of affinity, you know, with with mainland China, and, and you know, and and so I I think sort of the U.S. Um, kind of the challenges of the U.S. response um, kind of tie very much um, in into sort of the pressures that the diaspora community are, are facing um, from from the Chinese Chinese government, and, and think this just ties back to what I said earlier. Where I think there just needs to be more information about sort of the diversity and variation, uh, kind of more direct engagement and outreach with with sort of diaspora uh, groups and diaspora individuals, and, and seeing you know Chinese Americans as as a resource for the United States to to kind of make. Um, you know, the United States society and, and sort of political system more resilient, right, against these threats of foreign interference and, and foreign influence. So I think seeing that as, as an asset and a resource is the right sort of mindset and foundation for, for U.S. foreign policy. And that in itself, I think, will undermine sort of Chinese efforts um, to, to sort of, you know, use the diaspora as, as a tool of foreign influence. Have you heard any community leaders sort of saying back off, Jack, to the Chinese okay. Communist Party. Mm -hmm. Stop presenting us in this mode. Um, have you seen any pushback of that kind to Beijing? Um, yeah, I mean, I think anecdotally, right, there, there, are, there are examples and certainly, right, there are, you know, Chinese Chinese dissidents or activist groups, you know, or people who come from Hong Kong or Taiwan who are seen as ethnically Chinese, right, who, you know, certainly don't identify the Communist Party. Um, I, I think the challenge is that, right, they usually, in many cases, uh, you know, have fewer uh, resources, um, you know, compared to Communist Party, right, which is, I think, a lot of CCP-linked individuals are sort of dominating a lot of these uh, traditional diaspora organizations. The um, you know, Chinese government has become, uh, you know, good at buying up, uh, you know, traditional sort of Chinese language media, um, you know, and, and so that has, um, I think, kind of over amplified kind of pro-Beijing voices and, and sort of drowned out these alternative uh, viewpoints. So, 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 you know, for, from a U.S. perspective, right, thinking about how to, you know, ensure that that these kind of diverse viewpoints can flourish or have have space to be to be you know disseminated or amplified, right, would be a, would be a good way of, of sort of countering these these challenges. Well, Diana Fu, Tobias Smith, Austin Wong, Audrey Wong, thank you so much uh, for the work, the scholarship you've done as part of the China Fellows Program. Uh, we look forward to continuing to follow your writings uh, in your careers. And we hope that we at the Wilson Center can play a role in that and, and in supporting your work. Again, we wanna thank the Carnegie Corporation of New York, 
uh, for its support of this program over the past two years. And I would especially like to thank uh, my Wilson Center colleague, Lucas Myers, who is in the background uh, in these programs, but he has actually been the conductor of the entire exercise over the past two years and has done a simply marvelous organizational job. So Lucas, thank you. Uh, and thanks to everybody online for tuning in. Thank you.